title of my sermon this morning is following the same, uh, it should be sign singular, following the same sign to different places. We'll take our scripture from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Do you remember the hit song in 1971, Signs? It's been redone, I think, uh, back in the 90s it was, it was covered. But the, sign, the song said, and the sign said, long hair freaky people need not apply. So I tucked my hair up under my hat and I went in to ask him why. He said, you look like a fine, upstanding young man. I think you'll do. So I took off my hat. I said, imagine that. Huh, me working for you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Well, humanity follows cultural signs all the time. They're continually, all your life. There have been cultural things happened, big things happen. Uh, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, George Floyd, COVID. And what we tend to do often with these big cultural signs is we follow them into philosophical shifts. I, when I was a younger man, I disliked philosophy. I didn't really understand what it was. Um, I thought it was foo-foo. What I've come to realize over the years is that we are floating in an ocean of philosophies all the time, every day. Everything you think, every common sense is a philosophy. At some point, there was a shift, a philosophical shift, and people began to embrace it. And there was some sign, there was some significant event, significant has the word sign in it, there was a significant event that pushed them in that philosophical shift. And after it's been common philosophy for a while, we call it common sense, but there was a time it wasn't. And oh boy, I put that, that's, I'm exclaiming there, can two people follow the same signs toward a different philosophy? So we've got to be careful. It's very important that we define what our underlying philosophy is as we approach this life, um, and especially as we approach the afterlife. So let me give you a couple examples. Modernism affirms the power of human beings. It is a, a hopeful modernism a hopeful philosophy, uh, human beings to comp create, improve, and reshape their environment. We can fix things with the aid of practical experimentation. That would be um, uh, scientific method, scientific knowledge, tech or technology. And the goal of this modernism is finding that which was holding back progress in the past and replacing it with new ways of reaching the goal that we've always had and maybe wasn't working. That's modernism. So to sum it in a phrase, we can get it right. We can get it right. Then you had postmodernism came along and it responds to the idea that we can get it right. It wasn't work. Classical liberalism was not fixing things. It was examining them, but not fixing them. So along comes postmodernism and says, well, actually we can get it right by taking that word right or that concept of being right and recognizing that it is relative. I am right in my way. You are right in your way. Being right, trying to be right is the problem. Everybody is fine as they are. So do you see that? You see a philosophy and then a counter philosophy. Both of them are extremely powerful. As I say that, hopefully you can see in our modern society the, 
how these things affect the way we think about things. And to sum up postmodernism, everybody's right. Congratulations. You're fine the way you are. Well, in contrast to that, and those are just modern, and, and I'll tell you, both of those are, let's just say they're tired and they're about to go to sleep and something else is coming. Radical shift. We are, you, you know how the world is crazy? We are in a philosophical shift and the next thing coming, I, I am not, I can't predict exactly what it is. I have some suspicions, but uh, we're in a shift. We're in a paradigm shift right now. Um, and soon everybody won't be right, I think. However, we'll see. But, but you watch, modernism and postmodernism will linger and flavor the rest of our lives. Um, so they're, I say they're tired. They'll back off, but they're not going to go away. But as Christians, what philosophies, what philosophy, what is our philosophy? Or what should be our philosophy? And that is a biblical worldview. I'm emphatic. That the Bible gives us a philosophy of living, how to approach reality, how to approach the problems of reality. And so a biblical view is that we were created by God. Now, that, that first phrase is the starting point for everything else. That's how the Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the universe. Now, he created us for a specific purpose. He created us for righteousness. The way I say, you hear me say it frequently is we were created to live in the Garden of Eden where we were righteous, we did righteous things. To, and that righteousness is to do, to act, and to think about our lives as they relate to God and as they relate to God's right and wrong standard. We are not the origin of right and wrong we are not we don't generate right and wrong we don't react to wrong by coming up with our own right and we don't you know rebel against rightness in society by doing our own wrong and so underlying that philosophy is that God is right and that is our goal as biblical Christians now there are people that call themselves Christians that may not agree with that but we are evangelical, and we, we believe the Bible was inspired by God to us. God had us in mind when he inspired it, and that he is telling us how to live, and we believe that he is right. Now, sin is a complicator. We, we say this almost every week, don't it? Sin leaves us in a jam, and we can only get it right or trend towards getting it right by reconnecting with God. And that's a challenge. Even for people that know the Bible, know the truth, the day-to-day -day of doing the things that we need to do to do be right is a challenge, is a challenge. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one reconnects with God except through me and my sacrifice on the cross. Um, and so that, that's where we stand in those competing. But looking at the same events, depending on your underlying philosophy, uh, you're going to see things drastically different. I, I, intellectually, I think it's fascinating. Now, everyone has to make a choice. Isn't that... I always am amazed by the true power of God. I ask, I ask my students sometimes, do you think God is a controlling God? And I have to think about it. Let me, let me poll. How many think that God is a controlling God? Raise your hand. Wait. Raise, raise your hand in your heart. God will see it. Um, and I always say to them, because, you know, they're not sure sometimes they answer he is. I was like, he's a pretty weak God if he's trying to control our behavior, isn't he? Because obviously we don't. Mankind in general. Taylor, can I get an amen? Mankind in general ain't doing what God wants them to do. Um, and so if he is a controlling God, he's the weakest possible God, I think. Anyway, everybody has a choice. They must choose whether to be right themselves. All right, I've been, I've been on the Internet, and I've, I've got some ideas about how I'm going to be right in all things. By, uh, someone might say that. Or are you going to be made right by Christ in submission to what Jesus did on the cross let him 
work, the slow, hard work of sanctification uh, to make you righteous. We are imparted with righteousness spiritually. Flashback to our lessons on salvation in Luke. Jesus, at the moment of regeneration, salvation, for the truly born-again person, Jesus imparts his righteousness. And so from that point forward, on our soul, if we happen to die accidentally or not or whatever, we are righteous when we stand before God. Not because of anything we've done our whole life, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. All right, that's all review. Uh, now, in Matthew chapter 2, where we're going to look today, there are two people or two groups of people that look at the same sign. And the first person sees the sign and takes it as a threat. They see a sign and do not like it a bit. Don't like the implications. Don't like anything about it. It is a threat to his power. The second group sees that same sign and takes it as a reason to begin a journey towards God. A reason to rejoice. And you're familiar with that sign uh, in this Christmas season. God sent a sign of his love. And it was that star, okay? But don't, don't get too crazy about the star. It's just a sign. It doesn't do anything other than announce God's intention, announce the fulfillment of God's plan. That plan was revealed in the book of Isaiah, I say over and over, 700 years before the sign, before the star was there. It says the Lord himself, he is talking to Ahaz, the prophet Isaiah is talking to Ahaz, and he, and he tells Ahaz to ask for a sign. Ahaz refuses. And he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Give you a sign. You Read yourself in there in the you. Do you need a sign that this life matters? Do you need a sign, a reason to get up and go? Do you need a sign to keep going? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And shall call his name. God hasn't forgotten us. He is with us. Your life matters. There was a plan made before the creation of the world for your life. And maybe two plans. I mean, we could get philosophical about it. Maybe an intended will and a, and a, a practical will, but we won't get into all that. God is with us. You, that is a sign that God has stuff for you to do. But not one single person was ever sa saved by looking at the star. Do you realize that? It was just a sign. It was just a sign. So the main idea of this sermon is though Jesus' birth makes salvation available to all people, to Herod and the wise men. Responses will follow either the wise men who came, who traveled towards God, worshiped and had joy in their life, had purpose, had contentment, or Herod who took the gospel as a threat and he rejected it, made him angry. So the wise men, we pick up in verse 1 of Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, this is Herod the great, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have saw, seen his star in the east, far in the east, and have come to worship him. So what did the wise men do with this sign that God sent to them. They came a long way. It was not an easy journey. It was, it was months they traveled. They were searching. The wise men came searching for something outside of themselves, something above themselves, a greater purpose that they could align their life with. They were looking for something that religion could not give. These, these men were religious men. And religion is, is really neither good nor bad. Religion is what we can do, what we can generate, something we generate. But their religion, 
in their religious practice could not give them what this sign promised to them. If we could achieve through religion actualization, if we could achieve oneness with God, atonement, whatever, would God really have become a man and lived innocently and allowed us to mistreat him and gone to the cross and died a torture death on our behalf, if we could perfect our religion, if we could get it right through religion. It was long foretold and long awaited. These men, God had prophesied, Jesus did not just show up that morning and we generate a religion out of it and say, hey, well, maybe... Now that we've got this new religion, maybe we can look back in old scriptures and find something to cling to. No, I'll tell you what. The Bible, the Old Testament is about Jesus. And how the, how the Jews can use it and not see that the Messiah was foretold and he showed up and it was foretold that they would reject him and they did it anyway. How they can use the Old Testament and not get that. I'm telling you. The sky is green for some people. That was sarcasm. My apologies. Um, number five, the wise men were following signs. They were following signs. God was active in reality. And they could look around and they could see the truth that God was alive and well and there was a necessary response. And they followed it. And finally, they came to worship, to put Jesus at the top of their list, to make Jesus priority number one. Herod saw the exact same star, but he reacted very differently. In verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And when the king is unhappy, Everybody else is unhappy. All Jerusalem with him was unhappy. He was called Herod the Great. He was a great builder. He was, he was an Idumean, which is a descendant of the Edomites, uh, the cousins of the Israelites. In the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Edom was annexed in, by the um, high priest, John Hyrcanus went down and conquered Edom and annexed them. And so they became Jews, sort of. Everybody, all the Jews in Israel were aware, yes, he was a Jew, but he was an Idumean Jew. Herod desired for there to be nothing above him. He desired what lots of people do, a lot of the things we do in life is so we can be at the top of the heap. And that's what he wanted. And he had found that place and he did not want to surrender that place. The things he did daily um, mattered a great deal to him and he wanted to keep it. He wanted to bar anything from being above him, outside of him. So contrasting Herod, how he responded to the sign with the wise man, the sign was right before his eyes. It was, they, he didn't have to travel for months to get to the, to the origin of the star. It was right there. Within, I think, 10 miles was where the star was pointing. He was fearful that there was something external, that there really was a God, that there was something above him. He thought, you know, human religion is more manageable than entrusting ourselves in faith to God. We can, we, manage, we can manage religion. Religion can be manipulated. He was unaware of prophecy, so he refused to attach. He, ref, he refused to look at the fact that this had been foretold for hundreds of years. Other than to use the prophecies, as we'll see here in a moment, to find the source of the sign and wipe it out. 
He dreaded signs, and he came not to worship, but to suppress and to conquer. So he, everybody made a plan in response to this sign. Uh, for Herod, when he had heard about all this, he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. So he went to the source, he went to the Hebrew scriptures, and he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. In his desperation, Herod looked to the Bible for something he could use to get his way. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, this was Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This scripture is, was at least 400 years old at the time, um, and it prophesied specifically uh, that, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now, that's not a great leap because Bethlehem is the hometown of David, and the Messiah certainly was in the line of David. So it makes a certain sense um, that it would be associated with Bethlehem. So how do people often respond when they learn that an, incon an inconvenient truth that causes them fear? That's what happened to Herod. Well, by scheming, manipulating, and lying. One, one approach, and that's what we see that Herod did in verses 7 and 8. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he'd gotten the information on where Jesus was supposed to be born, where the Messiah was. Then he called in the wise men secretly, determined from them what time the star appeared so he could do some calculations. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, hey, go search carefully for the young child and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. That last is just a lie. He is manipulating and using them. He's making a scheme. And we know, that we know what his intention is, to assassinate the Christ. It, that's a pompous person, isn't it? Uh, there's been a prophecy. There's been prophecy for thousands of years. And it's so specific to say, this Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And he's like, you know what? I think I'll kill him because that's inconvenient for me. You know, uh, if we didn't know people like that, we wouldn't believe it, would we? So following the signs in verses 9 and 10, when the wise men heard the king, they were wise men. They could smell a rat. They, they could see the, re, the, the writing between the lines. They departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, when they followed it to the source, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Are you looking for a sign this morning? Human life needs a purpose. Hmm. When we fight, we're incredibly tough at times when life requires, and then that whatever is causing us the need to be tough is removed or solved or, or, or completed. Sometimes we get really, we get really lazy because we do need a purpose. We were created for purpose. We were created to walk with God and to worship God and to live lives beside God that were pleasing to Him. Sin creates separation from God, and so we have lost that purpose, that need to live a life pleasing to God. When we look for spiritual signs, our life has spiritual significance, spiritual meaning, spiritual purpose. So when you wake up Christmas morning in a couple weeks, the baby Jesus being born in Bethlehem is God's sign to you that your life is significant, that your life matters. Your life may not be the way you have envisioned it. You, you may not be thrilled with current circumstances. But God was not tricked or fooled or surprised that you are in the situation you are. God says, look to me. Repent of your sins 
and begin to live or continue to live or seek more significance in me and in my purposes each day. We all have the same sign that God is with us, and that is the birth of Jesus. So the wise men worshiped. They gave, they attributed value to this child, just a baby born to ordinary citizens, ordinary Jewish citizens, at least ostensibly nothing divine, nothing majestic necessarily in the scene they found. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. When they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, the most valuable things that they could, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's a common thing. We've all had lots of Christmases. How valuable is Jesus' birth to you this morning as you think about it? It's a time of remembrance. But how significant is that sign? What does it change for you day to day? So what is the opposite of worshiping the power of the God child king? It's rage. It's interesting, or at least in the way the story is told, the opposite of worship is rage. I'm not going to make Jesus important. And it makes me mad that I should it makes me mad. Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. When Herod heard, when he had saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was exceedingly angry. When he saw that he was not going to be able, they were not going to bring him the child, he was exceedingly angry. He therefore, now look at this wild rage, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the districts around it from two years old and under, according to the time which had been determined from the wise men. It's an interesting thing. In the Old Testament, as the children of Israel are sliding further and further into apostasy, further and further away from God, they began to sacrifice their children to the pagan deities. There seems to be a theme in scripture that when a society is moving further away from God, they begin to not protect children. Just an observation. So what is the opposite of worshiping the power of the God child king? A king seeking to retain his own power by killing powerless children. Do I need to tell you that that's ungodly? Do I need to tell you that that's wicked? And they saw the same sign. Two people looking for a sign. The first sees a sign and takes it as a threat to his power. That is Harry. Know that some people, as you go about this week, as you live a life that is significant, as you live a life that says, I want to honor Jesus. I want to say things and do things that are pleasing to Jesus. I would like to tell you about the gospel. There are people that are going to be threatened by that. Love them anyway. Jesus came and died for the people that were threatened by his power. Pray for them. Keep doing your thing. Because uh, Pray because only the gospel has the power to save them. So don't depend on something you do. Depend on God and keep honoring God. The second person in this story, the second group of people, sees the same sign and takes it as a reason to rejoice. It's not seeing the sign. It's what you do in your heart in response to the sign that counts. How will you respond Christmas morning to the ultimate sign of God's love? Let us pray. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. Lord, help us not only to remember that you became a man and walked among us. Lord, help us to take up our cross and follow you in all the ways that we can. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.